This morning, I get to introduce a friend. Dr. Kamig Alexander is the Executive Director of the Chaplain Endorsement Commission, and I'm going to let him explain what all that title means. Uh, but let me just suffice it to say that he and I have served together for a number of years in chaplaincy before you guys were kind enough to give me a home after I stepped out of the military. Um, but Cal and, and Cindy and, and I have known each other, and of course Mickey as well, as we've, we've worked together. Where I was on the green side of the house, he was on the blue and the white and the brown. And I don't know if you're aware of this, Navy chaplains support the Coast Guard, the Marines, and the Navy. And he was in a naval chaplain while I was in the Army. And just wanted to, to he, he said, can I have a few minutes? We're coming through town. And I said, no, sir, you can have the pulpit. Uh, I wanted him to be able to share what's on his heart this morning. Uh, we as a church have in the past couple of years begun to support the Chaplain Endorsement Commission through our missions work. It's one of our monthly gifts that we give. And so I wanted you guys to hear directly what it is that we're supporting, how it is that we're, we can engage more, and the things that we might be able to do to support military, institutional, industrial police, fire, hospital, hospice, if you've ever run into a chaplain, that's what we support through the Chaplain Endorsement Commission. So, I, Cal, please come and share with us. Well, thanks, Mark. Not everybody is so gracious as to yield the pulpit, uh, so I appreciate it. A lot of times we visit churches and I might get a minute or two here or there, but uh, it's good to be here this morning. We will take a few minutes and talk about the commission, and then when you're done, if you have any questions, we'll get right into our message and, and uh, the Word of God. But before that, I, I thought about a story when the, the lady was playing uh, Jesus Loves Me there. Of course, I grew up with that. And the story goes, a uh, pastor sets down on a plane and uh, sits beside a guy, intellectual looking guy and so the guy wants to engage the pastor and he goes you know what do you do oh i'm a pastor and so what do you do he thought he you know engaging back and he goes oh well i'm a scientist you know i'm i'm a uh, colleague of carl sagan you know the mysteries of the universe and i help him with his tv show and all the great scientific things that go on and all the mysteries of science and science can explain all the mysteries of life, and he just goes on and on. And so he could tell the pastor was getting a little, you know, okay, heard enough kind of attitude, and he goes, so pastor, I think I understand your field of study, your discipline of study, and can sum it up with this little, you know, uh, tune. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. And the pastor said, well, it's not quite as simple as that. He goes, if you think you can sum up all of my field of study with those words, then I could probably sum up your field of study with these words. Twinkle, twinkle, little star, how I wonder what you are. So, <clears throat> so in short, uh, the Chaplaincy Endorsement Commission was formed back in 1969 by some leaders of our faith group who wanted to provide opportunities for our ministers to serve as chaplains. And it started out for those interested in military service. You have to be a recognized faith group to be able to do that, recognized by DOD, the uh, Armed Forces Chaplains Board. And that's a little difficult for us uh, as the independent Christian churches and churches of Christ because we have no headquarters. But we are recognizable. You know, we have our gatherings. Uh, in those days, it was the North American Christian Convention and the International uh, Conference on Missions. And, and we have, um, you know, the directory of the ministry uh, uh, lists all of our ministers and all of our uh, churches. And then there's the seminaries and the Bible colleges. So we were able to be recognized by the armed forces and our chaplains have been serving ever since. The... Uh, challenge is, uh, because we have no headquarters, we have to function as missionaries. And so that's why we're here. Uh, we serve as, as missionaries 
uh, in the Christian churches and churches of Christ. So we appreciate your support the past few years, and we hope that you'll continue to support us. Uh, we'd be glad to talk to you about how to do that. Uh, we have the booth set up out there and to be able, uh, be glad to be able to uh, talk to you about that in a little more detail. Uh, we're set up to receive, you know, of course, checks and we also have some electronic opportunities too. So, where are we at now? Uh, we currently endorse 268 chaplains. Uh, we've got about 35 chaplains in the chaplain candidate program uh, with the military. And I probably have six or eight packets on my desk of people putting their information together uh, that are getting ready to uh, apply uh, and submit to the commissioners about that. Uh, the commissioners, there's 12 of them. They're scattered out all over the United States. Most of them are presidents of Bible colleges or seminaries. Uh, so we got everywhere from uh, Johnny Maurice, who is a 24 Navy year Navy chaplain at uh, Mid-Atlantic Christian University in Elizabeth City uh, to Paul Alexander on the West Coast with Hope International in LA and they're scattered all the way through there. So uh, our chaplains are serving as Mark said not only in the military all the branches but also in hospital, hospice, prison, jail, police department, fire department, um, in corporate America. Tyson Foods employs 120 chaplains I didn't know that before I took this job, but there are opportunities all over the place. Uh, one of our, um, you know, uh, unique things, I think, is that we send out these 268 missionaries, and because their salaries are paid by either the military or by the institution, um, it rare, you know, uh, with a little bit of an exception, it costs the church what? Nothing. Yeah. Costs the church nothing. We send out 268 missionaries, and with the exception of what it costs, Cindy and I to go around and talk to, you know, the churches, the Bible colleges, the seminaries, or the conferences, um, it costs the church nothing. And so we think, you know, if you're interested in return on your investment for your mission dollar, then the commission is one of the greatest opportunities, right? What, what other um, mission organization has the opportunity to send out 268 missionaries? And it doesn't cost the church anything. We've had a couple of new um, commissioners, and one, the last two we had uh, come on board are a little more uh, financial folks. Uh, Dusty Rubeck was the president of... Uh, Church Development Fund, CDF. And so in a recent meeting, he goes, so Cal, I hear what you're saying. What does that equate to? I was like, oh man, I never even thought about that, right? Uh, I can figure out what the military chaplains are worth pretty easily, and that's in excess of $10 million a year. And so the, the civilian chaplain is a little bit hard to figure, uh, but it's probably in excess of $5 million a year. So the commission saves the church about $15 million a year in salaries uh, for the missionaries that we send out. So we feel like it's a, a great opportunity. So I think I'm probably going to stop there and ask the face of the operation, Cindy, if there's anything I, I need to mention. Here's my lovely wife, Cindy, uh, and she's the face of the operation. I'm referred to as the strong back and the weak mind part of the equation there, so. Anything else? Right? Okay, so questions. Anybody have any questions about the commission and the, the work that we do, the chaplains? You can go on YouTube. There's videos of the chaplains uh, at uh, conferences and things. There's videos of what they do. We send out a newsletter. Uh, if you'd like to be a part of that, then uh, there's a sign-up sheet at the table. Uh, you can go to our website, uh, cectacchap.org and see all the past newsletters and all the pictures of all the things that the chaplains are doing. They're doing great stuff, uh, great ministries. Um, so we, we enjoy those. All right, so any questions? Okay, good, Mark, anything else? All right, well let, what's that? Here we go. All right, so we're gonna look this morning at um, 
2 Corinthians chapter 5 and going to verse 6, and the fact that we're ambassadors for Christ. And really, that's what the chaplains are all about. You know, they are on the front lines of ministry in our armed services and sometimes literally on the front lines uh, with our, our troopers. And so um, we feel like there's great opportunity to be ambassadors for Christ in the military. And then, you know, our civilian chaplains at hospitals, especially this past few years with COVID, what great opportunities they've had to minister to people. And it's not just the patients, but it's the staff. Yeah, what's it like when you devote your life to uh, saving lives and then you start losing people, you know, on a regular basis? That really eats away at the staff. And so there's been great opportunities for ministry with the staff. And then, you know, you go into the other opportunities in prisons. Uh, just before Easter, I think the Sunday uh, preceding Easter, one of our prison chaplains had 75 baptisms. Uh, we've got an army chaplain that is in a training environment. So uh, in, the, in the army there, and he gets a new cycle of recruits every 12 weeks. He's saying he's averaging about 25 baptisms every cycle. Uh, and I was at Paris Island, my first duty station. I had 326 baptisms on Paris Island just by giving them the opportunity uh, if they haven't had that uh, opportunity, uh, like our, our new brother here. So, ambassadors for Christ. So, uh, let's see, we'll see how good Mark is. You know what it means when the minister takes his watch off and puts it on the pulpit? Absolutely nothing. So, <laughs> buckle up, here we go. All right, here's our passage, uh, verse 14. For Christ's love compels us, because we are convinced that one died for all, and therefore all died. And he died for all, that those who uh, died should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and was raised again. Now this whole idea is prevalent throughout Scripture. You know, we can quote all kinds of verses. You know, I've been crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live. Yet not I, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I live, I now live by faith in the Son of God who died and gave His life for me. And of course, the words of Jesus. If you want to follow me, you must what? Deny yourself, pick up the cross, and follow me. And I don't think we really get the impact of that in our society today. In our culture, in our society, there's always you know, this opportunity. I grew up watching Western movies. I grew up in rural Kansas. And uh, actually, my dad's nickname for me was Cowboy. So uh, I grew up with all that kind of stuff. And, you know, in the Western movies, somebody might be accused of a crime and they've been, you know, they're going to hang him, right? And they up in the gallows, the noose is around their neck, the guy's hand is on the trap door, and somebody comes riding up, waving an envelope. Guess what? A reprieve from the governor. And they, they get to go free. Or, let me date myself. Does anybody remember Elliot Ness and the Untouchables? Yeah, by those days, we weren't hanging people anymore. We were electrocuting people, right? And they'd have him strapped in the chair. And I don't know why, they always did it at midnight, right? And they, the, the camera would go from the, the clock, it's three minutes still, to the phone, we're expecting a call from the government, to the individual, to the clock, to the phone, to the individual, to the clock, to the phone, and just in the nick of time, the phone rings. And it's a reprieve from the governor, and they get to go free. So that's our mindset. That's our culture. That's the way we think about things. But it was not that way under Roman law. Under Roman law, once you touched the cross, legally, you were dead. Now they say that people had lived three to four days on the cross, physically. But legally, they were dead. There was nothing anybody could do for them. There was no taking them down off the cross while they were still alive. So when Jesus says to his followers, if you want to follow me, you have to deny yourself, touch that cross. They all knew exactly what he meant. Once they touched that cross legally, they were dead. And so that's 
what he's calling us to in this passage. That's what Paul's writing about. For I am convinced that one died for all, and therefore, we're all dead. That's the attitude we should have about ourselves. And the life I now live, live, I live for Jesus Christ. And there's a certain sense of freedom about that. Right? Here I am. Use me. And that's exactly where Paul's going with the next verses. So, verse 16, From now on, we regard no one from a worldly point of view. Though we once regarded Christ in that way, we do so no longer. Therefore, if anyone's in Christ, he's a new creation. The old is gone and the new has come. And all this is from God who has reconciled to himself us to himself through Christ and gave us this ministry of reconciliation. So if we have taken up the cross, we have a new attitude about ourselves. We're dead, dead to the world, alive to Christ. But we can't look at other people any longer the way the world looks at them. That's just not the way it works. I had to learn this lesson the hard way. I uh, had an opportunity to lead some mission groups with uh, Christ in Youth. Cindy and I led the fish first uh, mission uh, group into Haiti. Um, and uh, so then on the second mission uh, trip, they were going to take 90 high schoolers and college-age kids, and they were going to divide them up into three groups of 30, and we met in Joplin, Missouri here uh, at the Christ in Youth um, uh, Center there, and uh, we're talking about logistics and everything. And Steve Sigler was the, the leader, and we're getting everything organized, and he goes, I got a question for you guys. Okay. He goes, I got a call from a youth minister uh, a couple of days ago. He's got a girl that wants to go on the trip. And everybody was like, okay, cool. You know? He goes, yeah, but I, I questioned him a little bit, and we really have a decision to make. Okay. So I'm talking to this youth minister, and he goes, um, so I've got this girl that wants to go, but she's a farm girl. And Sigler's going, well, pfft. What does that mean, right? Farm girls come in all shapes, sizes, and colors. And so he pressed the youth minister, well, what do you mean by that? Well, you know, she's a real farm girl. No, I don't know what you mean by that. You're going to have to explain it to me. Well, he kind of him hot around. Well, she's a big girl. Oh, how big? Well, she admits to 325 pounds, but I think she's quite a little bit over that. And so we understand that might be an issue. Yes, that might be an issue in Haiti. It's a tropical climate, a lot of physical demands. And so we talked about it and said, okay, here's what we're going to do. We're, we'll give her a chance, right? We'll take her. At the first sign of any medical issue, she is on a plane and back to the United States. Okay, great. Who's closest to the airport? Guess who? The McAlexanders. We're at Christiansville, just outside of Port-au-Prince. And uh, here we go. So, um, we got into the country. I divided the kids up into small groups to do a study guide. Just by the draw, this young lady, her name was Kim, ends up in my group. And I'm assigning scriptures, and young people are reading passages. It comes Kim's turn to read, and guess what? She can't read. Maybe a second grade reading level. And I remember thinking to myself, okay, Lord, what am I going to do with this girl? You know, she... She can't go on the long hikes. She can't do the physically strenuous work. Um, Lord, she can't even read. I don't know what I'm going to do. But, you know, things got busy, and we had a doctor with us from Rolla, Missouri, and his wife was a nurse, and they opened up a clinic, and a couple of days later, they bought in a baby. Du Franck. And uh, Du Franck was a mess. He had like three or four major things wrong with him. Uh, the biggest concern was a staph infection. And so the doc from Rolla, who, who said he was seeing stuff he'd never seen before in his whole career in Haiti, <laughs> says, we've got to get this kid to the hospital. They load him up, headed into Port-au-Prince, not prepared for 
medical conditions in the country of Haiti where 50% infant, uh, infant mortality rate before the age of two. 50% of the children died before they reached the age of two. And I uh, got to the hospital there in Port-au-Prince and the uh, staff there took a look at this little guy and said, no, we're not going to waste any of our resources on an if. And they turned him away. No treatment at all. Well, the doctor from Rolla and uh, his wife, the nurse, and the nurse at Christiansville weren't going to take that for an answer, so they brought him back to Christiansville, and they began to cobble stuff together. They got an IV going and some antibiotics going, and they were treating the other issues. And the doctor said, it'd be nice to have a 24-hour watch on Dufranc. Okay. So I asked, and the girls, Roger, dried up, and 24-hour watch the first day. The next day... You know, lots of things to do, lots of opportunities, and so a few of the girls fell off. Second and third day, a few more fell off. The fourth day, I went to the nurse's house to see, uh, coordinate some things. There was only one girl left on watch. Yep. So, I had to reevaluate my attitude, right? And... uh I can remember going, okay, Lord, I get it. You know, forgive me. I had, didn't have a clue what you had in mind, but obviously you had a plan. And uh, the takeaway is what? What's the takeaway from that experience? It's a passage. If you want to be used by God, guess what? He doesn't care. He doesn't care your capabilities, your background, your education, your intellectual level. All he cares about is what? Yeah, that you surrender to him and you say, God, use me however you will. And so I have to say, uh, do not tell me, and don't be offended by this, but I mean this sincerely, do not tell me that God can't use you. As a chaplain, I heard that a lot. Oh, God can never use me, chaplain. Don't tell me that. Do not tell me that. Because I know that if you surrender to Him, He can and He will use you. So that's the call of this passage. So, from now on, we don't regard anybody from the world's point of view we regard them as Christ would regard them. And we regard ourselves as Christ regards us. So how does Christ regard us? Well, the next verses tell us. All this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us this ministry of reconciliation that God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting men's sins against them. Hmm. All right. And has committed to us the message of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors, as God were making his appeal through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. God has made him who had no sin to be sin for us, that in him we might become the righteousness of God. We are the ambassadors of Christ. We are uh, the envoys of Christ. We are those that have been chosen to take the good news of the gospel to the world. So, little chaplain story here. Uh, we're at uh, ICOM, and I notice a kid, maybe 16 years old, he's kind of hanging off into the shadows there, never approaches the booth. Uh, we've got 30-some chaplains running around, uh, and I see him a couple of times, so I go engage him. His name is Judah, and, uh, <laughs> and Judah uh, goes, uh, am I getting this right? Am I understanding this? I've always wanted to be in the Air Force, uh, but lately I've felt a call to ministry in my life. Are you telling me I can be in the Air Force and a minister of the gospel of Jesus Christ at the same time? 
And I said, yeah, Judah, that's exactly what we're doing. That's exactly what this is all about. And he goes, do you have any Air Force chaplains here? And I said, sure. So I took him and introduced him to a couple, Mike Ferrar and, and uh, uh, Carollo. And, and uh, he goes, have any, either of you ever flown in a C-17 Flying Fortress? My favorite airplane is the C-17 Flying Fortress. And they both go, yeah. And Ferrar goes, yeah, I had a whole squadron of them, did it all the time. You know? <laughs> and he goes, you mean to tell me? that I can fly in a C-17 flying fortress and preach the gospel of Jesus Christ at the same time? And the chaplains go, yeah. And he goes, <laughs> yeah. We are ambassadors, envoys of Jesus Christ in this ministry of reconciliation. And I heard a story uh, when I was coming up uh, and I, I, it's a great story, but I didn't know whether it was true. Sometimes, you know, ministers, preachers, you know, we pick up stories. Sometimes they're a little embellished, uh, you know. But um, a few years ago, I was at what used to be uh, the NACC, and they were celebrating like 75 anniversary, 75th anniversary of the conference or whatever, and they were flashing pictures up from uh, historical. And I see the guy's picture. His name was Garland Bear. He was a medical doctor, Garland Bear. And uh, there he is. And so I'm going, wow, the story must be true. And uh, one of the older commissioners, uh, Wayne Shaw from Lincoln, I was telling him about that. You know, I was, hey, I saw Garland Bear's picture. And, and Wayne goes, oh, yeah, I saw Garland Bear. He was in our house all the time. <laughs> okay. I heard this story. Is it true? Yeah, it's true. So the story goes like this. Uh, Garland uh, decides to be a missionary in Thailand. He's among the hill tribe people up in the north of Thailand. And um, he goes into this village and he preaches the gospel. And it, it, they get it, right? They get it. And the whole village converts, including the chief. I mean, they just embrace this, this uh, Christianity thing. And uh, he see. His intention is, he goes, I'm going to spend six months in this village, and I'm going to disciple these people, and we're going to have a great time together. But the message gets out. People start coming in from other villages, and they want to hear the gospel. And then after a few weeks, they begin to beg Garland to go out to the other villages, you know, come to, come to our village. And so he talks, and uh, they decide, yeah, We'll send you out. So he leaves the people in the original village a copy of the Bible in their language so they can read it. Kind of explains that it's letters from, you know, the people who experienced it. And uh, he heads out. I'll be back in two weeks. Well, one village led to another village that led to another village that led to another village. And he was gone six months before he got back. He's walking into the village, and uh, kind of in the center of the village, there's a new structure. And it's filled with all the things that these people consider valuable, right? So there's food, and there's clothes, and there's tools, and all this stuff. And he thinks, oh, no, man, they've kind of fallen back into their animistic worship. Something's going on. You know, I don't know what, but, you know, we'll figure it out. So he... Uh, has a chance to sit down with the chief, and the chief, you know, they visit, how'd it go? He kind of gives a little report of his experience. And the chief finally goes, hey, do you see the stuff in the center of the village? Yeah. He goes, uh, what is that? He goes, well, it's, it's our collection. Your collection? Yeah, we were reading the, the letters that you left us, and there was a letter from Paul that said our brothers in Jerusalem were in hard times, and they needed help, and we don't know where Jerusalem is, and we don't know these brothers in Jerusalem, but we've taken up a collection. And in a letter, Paul says he'll be by to pick up the collection. And, and so, you know, we've got it all ready. So whenever Paul comes, we'll be ready like he asks us to be, and we'll give him the collection. And however it happens, it'll end up with the brothers in Jerusalem that need our help. And Garland was like, oh, my gosh. How am I going to explain this, right? Finally got up the courage, and chief, I'm sorry, but that letter was written 2,000 years ago. Paul's been dead almost 2,000 years, and 
Brothers in Jerusalem, yeah, they don't need your help anymore. He said he was not prepared, however, for the response. Chief looked at him, looked him right in the eye, and he said, why, why, why did it take 2,000 years for somebody to come and share with us the good news of Jesus Christ. 2,000 years. All of our ancestors have died and gone to hell because nobody came. Why did it take 2,000 years? Darwin had no answer. But the question still remains for us. Who is it in your life that might pose that same question? That might look you in the eye and say, why did it take you so long to share the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ with me? Why did it take so long? There's a sense of urgency in that verses that we're going to end with about sharing the gospel, sharing the good news of Jesus Christ with those that we come in contact. Perhaps it's only you that has that opportunity. It's only you that they know. It's only you, and statistics show that people are most receptive to the gospel when it comes from people they know and people they trust. Who is it? that knows you and trusts you. Mark and I are ministers. We're suspect from the beginning for some people, right? Yeah. They don't trust us, but they might trust you because you're like them. And so here's how Paul ends the thought. Chapter 6, verse 1. As God's fellow workers, we urge you not to receive God's grace in vain. Don't have the attitude, oh, I'm saved. That's all that's important. Right? When people all around you desperately need to hear the gospel. Don't receive God's grace in vain. For he says, in the time of my favor, I heard you. In the day of salvation, I helped you. I tell you, now is the time of God's favor. And now is the day of salvation. And now is the time that you need to be looking around your life and saying, who is it that would ask me that question? What took you so long? What took you so long? Now is the time. Today is the day. May God bless you as you reflect on his work this week. Thank you, Cal. I have the distinction of, he was mentioning Tyson. I was the first Christian church, Churches of Christ chaplain endorsed to work at Tyson. Uh, when, when, we've, when I first was stepping away from the military, I uh, worked for Tyson for some months before you guys picked me up. And so uh, the things that he has shared has awakened so many stories in me that I don't want to take the time this morning to tell. But know that your life can be absolutely different than it is. I'm not recruiting you to come be a chaplain, but I am recruiting you to be an ambassador. I will tell you there is nothing better than, and he's, than sitting at three o'clock in the morning with all the drunks coming back in from the bar going, hey chaplain, got a question for you. I've had some of the best conversations in my life at 3 o'clock in the morning. I've had some of the best conversations in my life. I, there was one season where I had, a, I had five individuals at a chapel 
we were in Iraq, and they said, we want to be baptized. And I stood up and did a two-week teaching on baptism, and I said, we're going to do this baptismal service. Two and a half hours later, I finished with the 39th or 40th person that just kept coming and kept coming and kept coming and kept coming. And there's this big black man sitting over on the wall watching. I'm doing a baptism. Look over. Doing a baptism. Look over. So I finally finished and I got up on the edge of the baptistry and I said, is there any other? I intended to do five and I've done 40. Anybody else? I've been here. I figured it would be, you know, Edward, we took maybe five, six minutes times 40. It was like two and a half hours later. I'm like, anybody else? (laughs) Nobody said anything. I said a final benediction over the group and I climbed down off the baptistry. And I felt this hand envelop my shoulder and I look over and it's this big black man. He says, "Um, what is this all about? So I gave him the two minute version of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And he said, what's to prevent me from being baptized? And I said, Not a thing, brother, let's go. And we crawled back in and I baptized him and he stood up and of course this was an international event that was going on in Iraq at that time, some 23 nations. I slapped him on the back as he got out and I said, where are you from, brother? He said, Ethiopia. And I instantly thought of Acts with the Ethiopian that said, what's to prevent me from being baptized? You never know who you're going to be up against. You never know who you're going to meet. I don't care if you're at work or at the park or at the Crescent or at Dr. Paul's. You're going to run into somebody who doesn't know Jesus. There is no greater gift. There is no greater joy than to stand with someone who is in absolute turmoil Cal issued us a challenge from Paul's writings. Amen, brother. Why did it take so long? Let us never hear from a friend or a family member. Why did it take you so long? Let us be Christ's ambassadors. Stand with me if you will. I'm going to come down here in front. If anybody needs prayer, I'll be here. Others will join us in prayer as well. As we sing this song, I'd ask you to evaluate your witness. I don't care what you did yesterday. What are you doing for Jesus today? I don't care what you get accomplished today. What are you doing tomorrow? Why did it take so long? Let it be simply because, well, I hadn't seen you in six months, but since you're here, let me tell you. Let us worship.